Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast, the place where we share the truth about food and farming from our kitchen to yours. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good morning. And together we hope to educate, inspire, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today, we are welcoming back Matt Maruka of Raw Optics. We have already done an episode with Matt previously this year. I and back in April. Yeah, we had it's such a It's been a while blast. for sure. It's been a while for sure. We had such a blast. We had to bring Matt back on. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So we're excited and I want to tell a piece of your story that I don't think we got to get into on our previous recording. And that starts with your health journey. So if you want to take us back and kind of give us the overview of your experience and journey towards true health, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a story that takes up quite a large portion of my life, the majority of my life and all of my memorable life effectively. So I'll give you the introduction. <laughs> when I was, I remember being five, six years old and having issues with my gut, like gas and just discomfort, just accepted it. Then as I grew older, uh, I remember in third grade having really, really severe pollen allergies. I remember we had a sort of spring day where all mm. the kids were out in the, you know, the lawn and the fields having a great time. And I was inside with tissues up my nose and my throat was itching mm. and my eyes were red and I was miserable uh, with itching, you know, not pain, but like very strong discomfort. And then when I went into middle school, I started getting really bad headaches. So headaches just from being in class, just accepted it. So all of this, I just sort of accepted. I remember my mom saying, you know, sometimes life isn't fair. Mm. Um, you know, these things are just genetic. What, what can we do about them? And it's not like she didn't want to help me or my parents didn't want to help. I'm sure they did, but you can only do so much when you, you know, are busy in survival accepting kind of the powers that be in the traditional paradigm. And, you know, again, most people are like just trying to get by, right? Yeah. And my parents were very much the same. And so what are you going to do, right? So they, my mother took me to Western medicine doctors and I'm uh, not joking. I'm not joking. They prescribed for my headaches. They prescribed me Advil for my allergies, they prescribed me Zyrtec, and this is a specialist, like an allergist. Mm -hmm. And for my gut issues, the gastroenterologist, also a specialist we went to see, just suggested that I take Tums, antacid medication, which is not really a good idea at all no. mm -hmm. for your gut uh, or anything really for that matter. But anyway, so that was my experience with Western medicine. Then I went to a naturopath who determined that I should do some kind of yeast cleanse and remove sugar from my diet and eat a certain way. And I imagine it benefited me, but I was 12. I don't remember very hmm. clearly. Maybe I was even 10 or 11. And it didn't cause my symptoms to go away because hmm. they continued afterwards. So anyway, I, so I wasn't healed. Let's say the root cause wasn't addressed. So I had some experience with, uh, gluten-free, dairy-free ideas because my cousins had, some of my cousins had celiac disease. So gluten-free was kind of like, even before it was so mainstream, it was something that my family had this issue with. So we thought maybe that I had that kind of issue, but I never had a positive celiac test even when I had done it. So hmm. you know, that wasn't the, the situation apparently. So then let's see, I went into high school and things were really elevated. I was running cross country. I remember in the fall, my freshman year of high school. And I just remember every day in school having really, really, a really upset stomach, gas, bloating, pain. And I just really didn't know what was causing it right now. Looking back, of course, it had something to do with food, because I'm sure if I fasted and didn't eat, I wouldn't have had the issues. But you, you got to eat, you know, I was, I'm growing, growing boy, hungry, mm -hmm. and I want to eat, but clearly something I'm eating, my body's not digesting, or it's not breaking it down properly or whatever. I, I didn't know that. 
So I remember I started getting really bad uh, breakouts of acne on my skin, and I started feeling very self-conscious about that. And I remembered something my mom had said that if I ate greasy foods, that that could cause like, it could mm. clog your pores. That was like mm. mom, you know, kind of wisdom. And I honestly don't, to this day, I don't know if that's really accurate or not. I mean, I'm just eating fried food with vegetable oils is obviously not ideal. And the body will try to get rid of that, whether it's through, again, the skin or other ways through of those toxic fatty acids. But anyhow, so I remember starting to research on the internet when I was now 14 in high school, I was just trying to research what do I do about this? I had this idea that I had a damaged gut. That was like, if, if I'm eating this greasy food and then my pores are getting clogged and if my mom's right, then maybe something's wrong with my gut. Mm -hmm. And then when you start researching damaged gut, I'm lucky that that kind of keyword came to my mind as if like a gift from God, because that keyword led to the paleo diet or the mm -hmm. whole 30 first. And I, I didn't have any money to pay for a whole 30 whole program. So it was like, I realized it's the same thing as the paleo diet effectively. So I started reading everything I could for free. And I remember at one point reading Mark Sisson, the primal uh, blueprint, uh, his book, uh, Mark's Daily Apple on it as his blog. And I was reading one article and he was talking about this concept of epigenetics and this idea that you could basically modify the expression of your genes based on certain environmental and lifestyle factors mm -hmm. and that our life isn't just the result of our pre-programmed genes, but rather the way that our genes are expressed, which we have control over. So not only did this, so this idea of, you know, improving my skin was originally something more related to vanity, but quickly it somehow progressed into, in this way, it progressed into me potentially being able to reverse other issues I had experienced my whole life that I didn't think could be reversed or changed. And so that's when the obsession began. That's when I became absolutely obsessed with diet and this kind of like optimization, but it wasn't like an inspired obsession. It was partially inspired, but it was also deeply driven by pain and struggle mm -hmm. and suffering and a mm -hmm. fear of continuity of that uh, experience. So I became obsessed with diets and I, I was so sold on the premise in this article that epigenetics are a significant concept that in an emerging branch of science that we should be aware of and that I could potentially change my health and my life by changing environmental factors. Now, the conclusion of the article and the prem of the, the information in general was that diet is 80% of the equation. And so if you dial in your diet, you're pretty much good. You're going to be good. And I bought that. So I was sold on the premise. I bought the conclusion, which I no longer to believe to be the truth, but I did at the time. Mm -hmm. And as a 14 year old who was desperate for solutions, it led to a fairly long road, like a two year road of really obsessive dieting. So I felt a lot better actually, when I first went on the paleo diet, which made me like a, basically a missionary for the idea of a paleo diet. I was like, <laughs> An evangelist. Them. An evangelist would be the perfect term. Yes. I was an evangelist for the paleo diet in the beginning. I was obsessed. I thought it was the thing. And so <laughs> the missionary, yeah, I wasn't exactly traveling overseas to spread the information, <laughs> but I was definitely, uh, it's funny now I am kind of like in a way a missionary for, for a cause, but anyway, cause I am quite abroad, but uh -huh. anyway, so at the time it was just an obsession. How could mm -hmm. I, how could I basically heal myself with food? And when I felt, let's just say, maybe 60%, 70% better just after cutting out all of this refined food from my diet, like I noticed immediately a significant reduction in my symptoms in my gut, headaches, allergy symptoms went down significantly. So I was even more sold that it's all diet and that diet's the thing. But then I started experiencing kind of ups and downs in my energy. I still had some immune reactions, uh, you know, this kind of allergy, hay fever, seasonal pollen allergies. And I was having just challenges with energy sometimes. So mm. sometimes I was fatigued and I just thought because I was convinced that it was all diet, I thought I just have to perfect my diet. And so I started to try to like self-diagnose in a way. So I was literally mm. going online, reading everything I could and I came to this idea that 
I should do the autoimmune version of the paleo diet because mm. the paleo diet helped me. And there's, are you familiar with the autoimmune paleo diet? Yeah. But if you want to expand on that. I'm not familiar. Not. So yeah, I would love to hear it. Yeah. Well, so the autoimmune paleo diet is a version of the paleo diet and maybe it's changed since 2015, but if it does, I don't really care. But anyway, I'm, gonna <laughs> what it was in 2015. I'm telling you now, it's not something you should focus a lot of energy on just so you know, yeah. dear listener, do not <laughs> go down that rabbit hole, please. This whole point is to spare you from this. <laughs> so, just no. But anyway, um, I went into this obsession about the autoimmune paleo diet because basically paleo is already very strict. So on the paleo diet, you're cutting out all grains, mm -hmm. all legumes, all vegetable oils, all refined sugars, and in some versions of the paleo diet, dairy. I may have missed one, but I think those are the, the four core things are grains, legumes, refined seed oils, refined sugar, and dairy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then- the autoimmune, so the idea behind the paleo diet, and people can understand the autoimmune paleo diet if they understand the paleo diet. The idea of the paleo diet is basically that we ate a certain way a long time ago when we were evolving or early humans, let's say. And since then, we've switched considerably. And in particular, there was a switch in what was called the agricultural revolution. We went from the Paleolithic age to the Neolithic age, which is the switch from basically being hunter gatherers to agricultural societies. Mm -hmm. And the argument that the paleo diet makes is that the switch from the Paleolithic diet, which is like a hunter gatherer stone age type of diet to this Neolithic diet, which is where we're eating more grains and less, for example, meats and, and fish and wild vegetables, uh, instead again, more grains, maybe more dairy that this switch caused a significant increase in disease and was the, the foundation of all modern illnesses. And that we should therefore go back to eating like our stone age ancestors in order to be free of modern illnesses. That's the mm -hmm. premise of the paleo diet, the art, the main theory of the paleo diet. And there is some solid evidence uh, behind this, like, you know, that, that the tribes who eat well, uh, are healthier, or they eat a certain way, they're healthier. But for example, they're not considering the fact that those tribes also live outdoors all day under mm -hmm. full spectrum daylight, just for yeah. example, things I learned much later on, um, how they have very different lives, lives than we do today. They're not on laptops, computers exposed to artificial light, a lot of chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. But the diet conclusion makes sense, although I now believe it's it's impartial. But so anyway, that's the idea of the paleo diet. And in effect, it's what we could call an elimination diet. So the idea is that Certain foods have the power to disrupt our body's proper functioning, and therefore we should remove those foods so that our body can function better or optimally. That's the premise, again, one of the many premises of, these, of this diet. So then the autoimmune paleo diet takes it a step further. People who go paleo but still have issues with autoimmunity or immune reactions basically should then they argue they should then cut out any other foods that are permitted on the normal paleo diet that could basically trigger the immune system. And the way they trigger the immune system is through this much talked about concept in the elimination diet and paleo diet world called leaky gut. So leaky gut is this concept that's become an extreme buzzword. Uh, there's not as much evidence behind it as people think, or there's at least, how can I say, there is yeah, there's less clarity behind the concepts of leaky gut than people think. In other words, there's some evidence that a leaky gut was critical to human evolution, um, that there's certain advantages to this having a sort of semi-permeable gut barrier. So, but the idea of a leaky gut is that our gut, are these junctions between these cells in our gut lining are pretty supposed to be pretty tight so that you don't get undigested proteins going into the bloodstream because an undigested protein from outside, once it gets into the bloodstream, the body doesn't know if that's just a food you just ate or it's a bacterial invader or something. So it could react to that. Right. Mm. And so, cause bacteria is also made of proteins. And also, again, if you're eating some food and it does have, for example, bacteria or something on it, you want that to be broken down in the digestive process before it comes in and could cause problems. Right. So there is it logically, it makes sense. The concept of a leaky gut. And I was fully sold on it that it's such a big deal. And I'm not saying it's not a big deal, but anyway, so 
the idea is that when we eat these grains and inflammatory foods, it causes inflammation in our gut and our, it causes the gut to become leaky. And so basically undigested food particles go into the bloodstream and then the, it, that causes the immune system to go kind of haywire to be activated. And then that can cause over time the immune system to start reacting to the wrong things like the body's own tissue, which would be autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. And so the autoimmune paleo diet says, okay, well, if you've gone paleo and you're still having issues, you need to go autoimmune paleo, which means you need to cut out in addition to grains, legumes, refined, or, you know, vegetable seed oils and uh, refined sugar and generally dairy also, unless it's maybe raw dairy. Now you need to cut out 100% of dairy. You need to cut out all nuts and seeds, 100%. You need to cut out all nightshade vegetables and... I think our that's eggs our eggs in there. Eggs, yes, uh, egg whites you need to cut out from the autoimmune okay. diet. Exactly. So wow. these it's very strict. So basically it's a, it's a very strict elimination diet and it's very close to what people today call carnivore. Yeah. So it's it's effectively a carnivore diet. Uh -huh. Um that is what, you know, and the carnivores were some of them were like all beef, salt, water and now some are eating fruit and honey and all yeah. this. They're trying to figure it all out. They're all <laughs> they're, working on. It. They're trying anyway, to sort it through. God bless him. So anyway, um, so anyway, the, the idea of the autoimmune paleo diet is that if you do it, you will again, reduce the inflammatory stress on your gut lining. Mm -hmm. And if you do it long enough, your gut will heal and then you will heal. And if you do it long enough, long enough, then your body's immune system will calm down enough so that it will stop reacting to these, uh, you know, to, to itself, because again, the idea being that it's being stimulated to react to itself because of the, let's say, eating foods that are inflammatory. And that's, that's essentially it. That's the idea of the autoimmune paleo diet. So, so you did this diet. Point, so I was doing this. Yeah, I was 15. And I was obsessed because I As thought a 15 was, year old. Yeah, it was it, 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 it actually got worse or stricter. Wow. Then I still thought there was more because I wasn't feel like I still was. In fact, I felt worse, the stricter mm. I was, which shocker. Now it makes more sense to me because mm. I understand that our psychology is probably more important for our health. In fact, certainly more important for our health than what we're eating. But anyway, no question for me about that at all. But anyway, and, and a great experiment to do that is just anybody, just take anybody and make them super stressed and unhappy and feed them a perfect diet or take somebody who's really happy and feed them McDonald's every day and see who who's, has better outcomes. And I'm mm -hmm. sure it will have better outcomes all over, over time. Mm -hmm. It's the person who's happy. McDonald's, I don't recommend eating ever, but <laughs> get the idea. It's just the yeah. person that came to mind. So that's anyway- like uh, and that's my perspective and opinion, and that's not medical advice, right? So, and it's a bit, maybe slightly exaggerated, but not by a lot, not as oh, much. I love it and would even be willing to unpack it right now yeah. because I feel like there is definitely some power in the stressors that we have in our body that are outside of just food. Yeah. And sometimes food can be a stressor, right? Oh, absolutely. And well, I we think- should unpack it, but I think we should, I, I'll, I'll make continue. one- Continue the autoimmune diet. So the idea that I, again, I didn't have this in my mind at the time, but now I do is that in the autoimmune paleo diet and similar elimination diets, including the carnivore diet and others, the idea is that if you stick with the diet long enough, in the case of the autoimmune diet in particular, your body will heal itself and that the body will come back into balance in some way just by removing the stress. But never once in all my time studying these diets did anybody ever actually explicitly say that out loud, nor did anyone attempt to even begin to pinpoint what the force is that's responsible for healing and the body healing itself. Mm. I think that's worth noting because there's that assumption again, that the body has this intelligence, innate energy, which is responsible for healing. Mm -hmm. But instead of thinking about how we could augment that, it's all about just getting rid of stressors and hoping that it just magically heals itself. But mm -hmm. I didn't know that I had no way at the time of really conceiving of that concept. I had to kind of go further into the insanity to see that it was insane. 
So anyway, I went further and that was with what's called the gut and psychology syndrome diet. Mm. And I'm not saying that this diet is, is, is wrong or anything. Um, there's a woman, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride from, I believe the United Kingdom who treated her child's autism by putting her child on an extremely restrictive diet of yeah. nothing but basically bone broth and very gently cooked meats and vegetables, which are really easily digestible. So like basically again, carnivore. Yeah. Uh, and I did that too. And so for a period I was just eating like bro bone broths and well-cooked meats and stuff. And I did not like it at all. Uh, I felt extremely restricted, didn't taste good to me, but I thought it was going to heal me. And honestly, I think my soul was just revolting. At a certain point, I felt so restricted as a 15 year old and my friends are all partying and having fun. And I'm like, just obsessed about my diet because I genuinely thought that like I would maybe not die, but that I would be miserable for the rest of my life, which might be worse than dying if, you know, I couldn't figure this out. Mm. And, you know, you, you give a kid a computer, you could pretty much go crazy, you know, think reading things on the internet. But anyway, so that was my experience. And I'm glad you asked and you wanted to go into detail because I don't think I've told this in this much detail in ever or in a really long time. But so I was in this when I was 15 from, from 14, all of 14 and, and most of 15, I was obsessed with this. And it was like, I mean, I, I spare you the, the details, details, but like I was so obsessed. I was pretty miserable to be honest. And every day I was like writing down everything I was supposed to eat and everything I couldn't eat. And it was like, it was a psychosis for sure, like orthorexia to the max. And so what happened actually in my personal experience, uh, and I could just look back and like smile and love myself and, and laugh, but there, I would basically go with my friends and, you know, maybe be tempted to eat something I should naturally. Right. And then I would have something like even a piece of chocolate, like a piece of dark chocolate, which is by many accounts, a healthy thing, you know, but by the autoimmune account, if I ate dark chocolate, it's going to affect my gut lining, cause inflammation, activate my immune system. And so even if I was perfect for the last three months, I've undone all of my work. Mm -hmm. So you have to be like a Nazi about your diet. If you're going to be, um, pardon the, maybe not politically exp correct expression. I don't know if that's PC to say that, but anyway, um, so basically not that you guys care, but anyway, <laughs> so really strict about the diet. And if you're not, and if, even if you make one mistake, you're basically back to square one. And I read that on one of these diet guru websites that if I made a mistake, basically starting from ground zero. So then what I would do is I would literally go and stuff my face and eat everything I wanted to mm. everything. I could. So I developed a really unhealthy relationship with food, thinking that food is going to basically heal me or kill me. And so if I'm like perfect, then I'm great. But if I make one mistake, then it's I better just basically it's all over and I better just enjoy it until I'm willing to hop back on the wagon. And it was it was very challenging for me for like, I, I think a good six to 12 months. I was in this like this, the throes of this experience. And like, I remember, you know, not hanging out with my friends because I felt like so confused and troubled and lonely and not, I'm not blaming the diets for this, just to be clear. This was just my own personal experience, but the diets were kind of just a, a kind of bystander on the scene. But anyway, uh, they, they were part of the experience. And so, and I'm glad actually, I'm very grateful to them because I learned what not to do <laughs> and I can kind of tell people where not to go based on my, at least based on my own personal experience. So, and I'm not saying diet's not relevant. We'll get to that. But so anyway, I tried the GAPS diet and finally, at the same time, I was just looking through all the forums. So I read all the paleo diet forums. I was trying to get some insight as to like what I could learn that would give me a different perspective. And I came across this information about a doctor named Dr. Jack Cruz, who was basically using this thing called cold thermogenesis, which is ice baths, a fancy term for ice baths, but way before anyone was talking about ice baths, the Iceman Wim Hof was just gaining popularity, but was not famous at all at this time. So this guy, Dr. Jack Cruz was actually talking about the science of how ice baths could optimize our biology and health. And I thought that's fascinating. And he talked about how you could take ice baths and if you ate seafood and it would help optimize the energy in your cells. And it was just like a different concept. And I started reading and then I started reading, listening to interviews from him and listening and learning about mitochondria. And then there was all these researchers who he was pointing to. So I started going and reading some of their research and checking out some of their lectures. And I was fascinated. I thought that's, this is so interesting. There's so much more. And the main point was basically 
this was kind of the, the pitch that, that caught me. Now it's, it's a bit distant in my memory. So I don't remember exactly what the, what the phrases were that really caught me, but it's something like, have you tried every diet and you're still struggling? And mm. I'm like me. And so <laughs> maybe it's because it's not about your diet. Maybe it's because your environment is, for example, destroying your mitochondria and your mitochondria can't process your food optimally. And for me, that was like, whoa, I've just spent almost two years obsessed about potentially the wrong thing. Or again, I can look and see it led me down the right path in the right direction. I had to go through that experience to learn the, the painful lessons, but I learned them, I think. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this, this idea was fascinating. And, and that's really like the intro story, just so you know, that's how I kind of got into this. We did talk more about some of the science I recall on our last conversation, but, but basically when I started learning about this information, it was about cold thermogenesis, about mitochondria, the engines in our cells. It was about light and how light can affect both in a good way and a bad way. If we're exposed to artificial light at the wrong time of day, it disrupts our body's circadian rhythm, natural production of hormones, uh, neurotransmitters, energy production, metabolism, the, and, and so on, the repair and growth hormones as well can be disrupted with a disrupted circadian rhythm. Whereas if we're exposing ourselves to a full spectrum of light, the natural light, which we evolved in, kind of like the paleo diet, but for light, if we're doing it in that way, then our, our organism functions properly. So now just, just to make a closing point on the paleo and autoimmune and GAPS diets and elimination diets in general, just so that people don't think I think they're horrible ideas. Um, in general, I think there's some sense to them. And if somebody's really sick and it's working, I would never encourage somebody not to do it. And I'm also not trying to say that diet's irrelevant. Like I'm pretty careful about what I eat in general. However, my experience, this experience and my experience in the, in the six years or seven, since I learned 28 years, since I kind of shifted into the light mitochondrial world, I started my company two years later, which was six years ago now, but basically it's that diet's important, but there's other factors that influence how well we process food. So for example, if you're eating a perfect diet, like, but you're only eating at night, then it's no longer a perfect diet. And, and it doesn't matter the food you're eating. And there's actually really good research to support this. So it's like, if you ate the whatever, if somebody's vegan, imagine something vegan, if you're a carnivore, imagine something carnivore or whatever, but whatever somebody's perfect concept of a healthy meal is, if you eat that meal at eight o'clock at night, I can say with pretty strong confidence based on the science that your body's not capable of processing it as effectively as if you ate that meal in the middle of the day. It's not only are you not going to get the most out of the meal, you're not going to break it down as well. You're not going to get the most nutrients out of it. You're not going to, you're going to produce way more toxic, toxic byproducts as the result of processing it less efficiently. Uh, but also it's disrupting your sleep because your body now has to put energy into digestion when it should be focusing on sleep and repair. And there's very good data about that. Like people who wear the aura ring, uh, they can see that when they drink alcohol, it totally disrupts their sleep. But also when they eat late, it disrupts their sleep too. And that's very clear, uh, both in science and in you know people's anecdotal measurements, which isn't just anecdotal, it's still uh, relatively objective. But so diet isn't just about the food you eat, it has to do with when you eat and psychologically, as we mentioned, kind of got to earlier, it's about how we're thinking mm -hmm. also has a very huge impact. So that's, that's what got me into this, uh, this whole realm. That's really my, my origin story that, yeah. So un unbelievable. Thank you for sharing that. Like you have, anytime we talk to anybody about the real food journey, I'm constantly just so like moved because people go through so much in life trying to search for things for themselves to make things better yeah. generally humans want to survive and thrive right and we are willing to do so many things and i love i love even the um some of the extra information and context you're giving us of like man it started out as a vain thing where i didn't like having acne and like i was searching for something which is like man it's so real it's everyone right everyone's like well i, I didn't like i wanted to lose some weight or i wanted to and then I went down this path. I started learning these things. And then next thing you know, I'm putting more stress and emphasis on perfection than I am on, you know, like proper, true living and being happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have talked to so many people kind of in support of what you were kind of mentioning before of 
man, there are so many stressors you can have in life. Stressors, stressors can come from the toxins or things that you're ingesting, the bad food, the, the lack of food, the lack of nutrients. Stressors can come from um, having a terribly hard day at work, right? It can come from overexertion from like in like a physical point like perspective. It can come from uh, light exposure. It can come from staring at my phone screen from, you know, 6 a.m. to, you know, 8 p.m. And then, you know, again, late at night because I can't sleep, right? There, there are so many things that can add stressors to your body that, man, and, and, and that's why I like what you said where it's like, man, the diet itself was not going to get you where you wanted to be. Certainly not by itself, right? And I also, I also believe, and I think that you were saying this, I mean, there can be small truths in diets. Mm -hmm. We can find some small truths in diets, but it's never going to be the end all be all, right? You go paleo, man, you might find some, some fixes to some, some issues or some challenges, some things that you're dealing with. And, you know, you're like your mom's like, Hey man, if you eat tons of greasy food, you're going to have acne. My, my guess is, is some, some acne probably cleared up for you when you started changing your diet up pretty aggressively. Yeah. And it was like, man, there probably were some fixes that you, that you had, but then inevitably you were potentially depriving yourself from energy that your body needed as you were an active growing kid in mm -hmm. you know, 14, 15. That's not like <laughs> you weren't just like a stationary person sitting at a desk, yeah. right? You were yeah. probably running around playing, you know, you know, you had, you had a lot of like, like your, all your body was changing. You probably hadn't even hit like proper puberty at that point yet as a mm -hmm, man. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, um, yeah, there was, there was probably some fixes that you found. And for those people out there that are on paleo today that are like, well, this is totally working for me. It's like, yeah, there's probably some good that's happening. And we, we talked about it in an episode, uh, discussing veganism. Cause we oftentimes, I, I wouldn't say bash being vegan, but we sometimes can be harsh on it. And I would say that there is so many good things that happen when you choose to, to choose a vegan diet. And the first thing that's amazing that you, that you do is you cut out a lot of processed food. Mm -hmm. if, if you're going like, you know, whole vegetables and, and, and you're avoiding, you know, like junk. But we've talked to so many people that time and time again, they experience this like healing, this, mm -hmm. this, this, this experience of like, wow, so many things are improving ever since I, I've cho chosen to go vegan. And then two, three, maybe it's 18 months, maybe it's two years, maybe it's three years later, they're like, and then I just started feeling like, ugh, like something was missing. I mean, we've seen people that went even as far as like 10 plus years and started losing their hair. Yeah. And, and it was Serious like- Serious nutrient deficiency. And, and it, was, it was like, man, you know what? I don't know that there's any diet that I would ever recommend. Mm-hmm. But would I say that all diets can be beneficial? I think, eh, I don't know all diets, but I think a lot of diets can have some benefits of learning. And what it really comes down to is finding out who you are, what your body needs, and taking in information from all kinds of sources. So I think there's a lot of things, Matt, that you went through that, man, the, the one major power, superpower that you have is a research mindset, mm -hmm. right? This ability to learn and to to almost be humble enough to say like, Maybe I don't have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. You know, when you were the, the, you know, evangelist missionary for paleo, you know, you probably had a little bit of pride going on there for a little bit. Cause like you'd seen some like improvements and you were telling everybody like eating, you know, McDonald's like you're scum, right? Like figure it out. <laughs> um, but like, you know, that real food elite is elitism. But then you were like, man, I'm going to learn more. I'm going to learn more. I'm, and, and I think that that educational kind of searching for more mindset can be very powerful. And, um, if you're, if you're, um, if you're willing to have your mind and keep your mind open. Um, anyways, so super stoked about that. And any, any reactions to that before we, before we continue on? I think it sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm in agreement. I feel like the diets are, they're a piece of the puzzle. And mm -hmm. so again, I don't want to bash anybody's diets because if somebody feels good doing a diet, then great, more power to you. I would add that one time, a good friend of mine, Ben Greenfield, the biohacker and trainer, I imagine you guys are familiar with him. He said to me, he said, you know, all these people are trying to find something mm -hmm. and they're trying, they're looking for the next biohack that's going to make them feel whole, yeah. what they want. And he said something along the lines of, they're not going to find it if they're just looking for it in the next biohack, like there's more. And he's referring to spiritual practices and deeper connection with God and so on. Uh, but that is 
what I've personally come to believe as well. Like many people, especially people who don't have a spiritual foundation in their life or something like that, at least they're looking for the biohacker, the diet, and it becomes like, I'm a biohacker. Like that's their identification. I'm a biohacker. I, mm. I hack my biology for optimal dopamine levels or whatever. Like, and that's when I got into the whole light world, that's what I thought. I thought that if I could optimize my circadian rhythm, start watching. So I was doing all these things that were indicated based on the science I was studying. So for example, watching the sunrise, watching the sunset to help set the circadian rhythm, drinking unfluoridated spring water, going barefoot on the earth, cutting out artificial light, filtering it with blue light protection glasses, all this kind of stuff. This was what I was doing as part of this, what I now call the light diet based on the information I was learning. And I definitely felt, in fact, sunbathing was one of the most powerful tools. I started to get tan mm. and, and just, I was also going through puberty, but you know, I, I've said this to people before, like for me, it's, it's just very clear. I have many, I know many people from high school, from my high school, for example, just kids I can think of who are like pretty scrawny, like lean, scrawny, pale, and like they went through puberty and they just became like a bigger version of that, you know, but that, that, that like those pale or not pale or, you know, thin or a lot of these things oftentimes didn't change significantly. Like their core appearance was kind of similar, but in a grown, like in a man versus a boy. For me, I didn't grow to be like six or five doing this stuff. Although, you know, you never know, but um, I, I grew naturally. I'm, I think I'm five ten, five eleven. but basically I changed in my appearance. Uh, my, I started to get more tan, although now it's winter, so I'm not particularly tan, but like a lot of things changed in my appearance that I don't think would have changed as significantly if I hadn't made such significant changes. Like I got a lot stronger and I had already gained some muscle just by eating so much more meat, but the combination of eating a ton of meat and being in the sun caused me to gain a lot of muscle. Now that's a whole separate conversation because I'm not as big of an advocate for eating unlimited amounts of meat now as I was then not necessarily saying there's anything wrong with eating meat, but it's just not my main focus. Um, whereas then that was like everything. So anyway, the, again, the diets can be great, but there's more to it. And I'm mm -hmm. now of the opinion that even when it comes to, so speaking of the biohackers, just to wrap that one up, I thought I would be able to optimize my brain chemistry and dopamine through this, what I called the light diet or still call the light diet, this, this physical approach, but using not food, but instead using light and energy in my environment. And I, so I thought I would optimize my dopamine levels, my hormones, my neurotransmitters, and I would just have this, like, whatever it was that I was looking for, that I would have it, that I would feel that wholeness, that fulfillment. Again, I didn't even know what I was looking for, but now I'm in retrospect, I think everybody's looking to feel whole, to feel love, to feel joy, just to be happy and at peace to some extent in their life. And I never ended up, ended up feeling that even with all the modifications I made to my life from the perspective of light exposure, I definitely physically improved in my condition, certain symptoms improved considerably, uh, even more. And then, yeah, I just felt better, had more energy and it just, the science made sense to me, but years later, even having started a company and having gotten into this space and applied all this, there was still a period where I felt effectively miserable, un really unhappy inside. And so, and on the surface, it's like, oh, this guy's, you know, someone might have seen me on, on Instagram or whatever on a podcast that, oh, this guy's sharing great information. He's traveling the world. He's 20 years old or 21. He's living the dream. Uh, you know, of course he's happier. He should be happy if he's not, but you know, there's no reason not to be. And, and in fact, there is no reason not to be happy, but uh, except those that we create for ourselves, I believe now, but I had or, or unconsciously accept. And it turns out that I had unconsciously accepted a lot of things for which to not be happy. And I was choosing to be a pretty unhappy person in my life based on the way I was living every day. And so even having gone through the whole experience with diet and finding out, okay, this isn't the be all end all, this isn't it. And then going through the whole experience with light and mitochondria and energy and circadian rhythms and unfluoridated water and grounding and blocking electromagnetic fields. Like for a long time, I was giving so much of my power away to like EMFs and 5G and cell phones and Wi-Fi. 
I still don't think it's a good thing to overexpose yourself to Wi-Fi. And, and some scientists would say any exposure is overexposure, but I still don't think it's like the best thing ever. Like when I'm in a position where I can use an ethernet cable or for example, uh, you know, just keep, I keep my phone on airplane mode. I try not to live in like major cities and I wouldn't stay in a rooftop apartment that has a cell tower right next to it. I wouldn't stay there for an extended period, but I was actively with my mind, making myself very stressed in a way that I could feel that is definitely harming me. I mean, again, the EMFs might be having, a, in fact, based on the science, they're probably having a not optimal cellular effect anyway, but then I could use my mind to make it probably 10 to a hundred times worse. And I was yeah. doing that. And so it's like the point being that the, the psychological element to me started to become really real and really significant. And I've even come to the point now where I believe that if we can tap into what I would call like a greater spiritual power, whether somebody wants to call it God or some, you know, in Chinese, they'll call it Qi, Qi Gong. Uh, I'm not saying that God and Qi are the same thing, just to be clear, but, but it, just as a frame of reference uh, or some example, some people talk about prana in, in the Hindu or Ayurvedic system. There's this energy flow that's within us and all around us that we could connect to that is the energy that ultimately powers us. It's not just food. It's not just sunlight. It's there are parts of it. And I've come to this belief that we could be much less dependent on food as well uh, through this other approach. Now, this is not, I'll disclaim this now. I, I disclaim when stuff, something I'm sharing is not strong, strongly based on existing science. There is science underpinning the value of things like acupuncture and qigong and it's growing but it's not super super well evolved but anyway i've come to this perspective that if we're unhappy and miserable then we're going to have a more negative effect than anything and if we're taking good care of ourselves and we can outweigh let's say a lot of these but we can let's let's break it down further if you guys would like or still yeah. wherever you want to go no I, I definitely believe that i think there's definitely some capitals in life that are extremely powerful for us to acknowledge. And oftentimes I've heard a good, a good example of the, of the kind of capital breakdown of what's important for healthy living. One, one example, it's not mine, uh, but they call it five, the five capitals. I think it's, it's uh, spiritual. Um, again, having a spiritual foundation or investment in your life, right? Kind of managing that, managing that your health, whether that's nutrition, fitness, um, all of those are important. Relational capital, there's financial capital. And then what was the fifth one? Educational? Mm, I don't remember. But having these things squared away and, and the, the, the concept is that you can't have them all perfect all the time. You just, there, no one has the, the capacity for, of time in their life to be always improving and constantly like benefit it, like, like thriving spiritually, financially, emotionally, you know, uh, 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 health wise, relationally. And uh, I can't remember what that fifth one is. I'm looking it up. Thank you. But that 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 um, framework allows you to zoom out sometimes and say, kind of exactly what you're saying, man. Um, where where am I currently? Like like let's do an audit, a, a capitals audit of where I stand today. And it might be that man, I just have not been focusing on my my health and wellness like I should be. And, and I'm not saying once a year we're doing this audit, right? I'm not, this is not me promoting the the New Year's resolutions. This is me promoting the, man, maybe on a weekly basis, just a check-in. Like, man, am I, am, have I been treating my family, my relationships, my wife, my kids, uh, those close to me, my loved ones? Have I been investing in them? And then like there's there's power in community, right? There's there's power there that, that can bring us joy and, and fulfillment. Is it intellectual? Probably. Well, that's, I said education, I'm not intellectual. Getting good, I'm not getting it good. Anyhow. I believe that's what it is. Um, and and it's, it might be like, man, I haven't been, I haven't been developing intellectually reading. I haven't been uh, research. I haven't been, I haven't been growing there. I haven't been in my fitness, right? But taking this audit and saying these five different capitals are something that, um, that I can review on a regular basis. Now, again, there's different frameworks out there of different kind of buckets or categories that we should be focusing on. But in every one that I've seen, health and fitness, spiritual and community are always in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's definitely stress that can come from financial stress, 
right? In my opinion. So I think that I agree with that. And if you're in a position where you know, I just can't make ends meet and you can have a great family, right? You can have, you can have, uh, you can be really fit, right? You can be really healthy, eating great food, you know, and man, we are, we are just struggling. Finding, we're in debt and that can be stress that impacts your life. And there are definitely measures and formulas. I'm not a finance expert, but there are definitely people out there that focus on this sort of thing. And no matter what kind of budgeting situation that you're in, there are moves or potential uh, efforts that you can make to try to alleviate that stress, I, mm-hmm. I believe. And so, so as we're, as we're taking the, let's say the five caps and dividing you know, 20% of our time amongst all five of those, right? Cause five times 20 would be a hundred. We, we might say, Hey, for this period of time, I'm putting 40% on health and wellness because I really need to kind of like up that game. Well, that's going to take percentage from something else. It's always a give and take. There's always a sacrifice that we make. And so it's, it's this never ending game of balancing out those different capitals. And it's so easy. We jumped on the podcast today. Uh, Matt asked, Hey, how are you guys doing? And I was like, you know, what, transparently, Matt, you know, it's a grind over here. Like we're working hard and we've been investing heavily into um, some of the uh, capitals that have been sacrificing some other ones. And just today we were talking this morning, uh, Elizabeth and I about, man, we, we need to, we need to spend some more of that percentage on some of our, our, our relationships, our friends, our, our, our community. Mm-hmm. And we've been doing a lot of buckling down and working. Right. And, um, and we've been doing a lot of family, doing a lot of family. So even within the relational bracket, we've been like 95% focused on our kids yeah. and our extended family. Yeah. We had, we had a sibling move across the street. We have another sibling down the street. We're trying to like solidify these bonds of family. And then you, you realize yeah. like, wait, I haven't seen my, my really good friends in like six months, <laughs> you know? So it's all, that's what I love about your story, Matt, is like you were laser focused on food and looked at food to heal you and heal you and heal you. And while that's a means for that, you have to broaden your your approach and you have to look at these other things. And what I want to do, I love this conversation because I, I think anytime you put your identity in something of this world, it's going to fall flat. I don't believe any of us should have our identity in this world. I think it should be, who you know, sons and daughters of your creator. And, and that's for you to figure out on your own. But for, for those who want to heal, I want to get into, let's say we have the food piece figured out. Mm-hmm. And let's say our mindset is appropriately centered on these broader capitals. We are we are giving them the respect they need. Let's go really practical. How can we, through this concept of light and optimizing mitochondria, and I even wonder if you've ever gotten into the research of methylation. I know that's coming out a lot right now, a lot of conversation about like you can eat the food you want, but if your genes don't support the methylation of these raw materials, you're never going to get the good the good nutrient density that you actually need. But I want to talk about how these, these various uh, influences that light has can impact us so mm. that we can use it as a tool. Absolutely, We can say, hey, we're going to use our intellectual capital to figure out how to optimize our light. Simple ways, um, because that's still, if you think about the average American, the average industrialized person, they're still inundated in this life cycle of eating probably poorer food than they should, living in environments that are poor, being surrounded by artificial light, not getting outside, right? So yeah, I love that. I want to get into some of that nitty gritty, mm. I think. Yeah, mm. sounds great. Well, where would you like to start? I kind of want to start in through what- the day. Like, can we go through a timeline of like, First thing in the morning, one, what is your body doing? What is it craving? And then I know people that wake up and the first thing they do is they look at their phone. Sometimes that's me. <laughs> so that's just like yes, the worst thing. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, share. So I've my approach has gone more into, let's say, everything I learned from the Western perspective basically supported traditional Indian medicine, a system called mm-hmm. Ayurveda, uh-huh. not all of it, but that there, there were so many almost uncanny similarities when I started to learn about Ayurvedic medicine that I thought, Hmm, maybe they already knew a lot of this. In fact, they certainly did. And we're just rediscovering that, you know, that mm-hmm. information with quote unquote science, right? Yep. What we call what we're, we believe that what we have is science and that what everybody else had before wasn't scientific. Quote unquote. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that anymore, but 
That's the belief that most of the researchers today have in their um, they've replaced God with the microscope. That's really yeah. what's happened, uh, as I would put it, in the world of science. And they think that by seeing things and looking at the fine details, they'll understand everything. But the funny thing is that the quantum physicists, they're more religious than anyone else in some way, as far as the way they speak and the, the mm -hmm. level of, you know, we don't really know, actually, in fact, where it all comes from. And it doesn't really make sense. And it's, there's all, it's all paradox when you go mm -hmm. down to the quantum level. It's it's really funny, actually. Um, it's ironic is a great way to put it. So because they thought they would like prove that God doesn't exist or that there's no greater unifying force behind all things. And that's exactly what they're doing or have almost done. So anyway, um, so for me, I just I have to disclaim that because if, if somebody's like, oh, I just want the, the cold hard, you know, the peer reviewed this or that, it's like, well, then go listen to Andrew Huberman. He's great. I love <laughs> him. And, you know, there's lots of great information there. But if you want the most advanced information, it might not be what's coming out of the papers. And that's yeah. honestly for people up to up, up. It's up to everybody to decide how they want to mm. approach that. So anyway, just sharing that so that uh, people have clear understanding of what they're getting when I'm sharing here. Um, so I've been studying under a, a friend and doctor who's studied this for decades. And I, I can share what I've learned both from, again, the science from studying Ayurvedic medicine and applying certain things and basically what makes sense. So anyway, that's, that's what I'll get into for people just to set our expectations clearly. So when we go through a day, I can tell you basically what I do and what's indicated by these different confluences of information that I've been exposed to that really make a lot of sense to me. So when we wake up in the morning, and this is different for men and women. So we have different energy systems. Men and women are very different. Uh, men and women, uh, the males and females split when eukaryotic cells first emerged some 2 billion years ago. According to traditional you know, scientific evolutionary theory, something like 2 billion years ago, there was a merger of different bacteria, which created sort of a supercell called a eukaryotic cell. So it's, again, the tr mainstream traditional science holds this perspective that there's three kingdoms of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukaryota, which are these eukaryotic cells, which are kind of like a merger of bacteria and archaea, in fact, and have basically grown significantly because of certain efficiencies that were implemented. So all big life that we see, and even certain small life like yeast, so fun all within eukaryota there are three so i shouldn't say it's a kingdom it's a domain those are domains and then a kingdom is plants animals and fungi those are the three kingdoms and so anyway all plants all animals and all fungi are eukaryotes which means they are cells that contain mitochondria inside of them and these i want to say all of them but there may be certain exceptions but almost or all of these Almost all or all of these uh, eukaryotes, eukaryotes have two sexes, male and female, for the purposes of, of this reproduction, which isn't just cloning the same cell over and over again, which is how bacteria divide in archaea, but rather mixing in the genes every generation to increase the genetic variability and the idea thereby being to increase survivability in different environments by enhancing the potential for beneficial mutations that arise. And so I know this might sound a bit odd, but male and female split 2 billion years ago. Humans split from chimpanzees supposedly a lot more recently than that. Now, what I would say, and this might sound like a really bold claim, but male and female in many ways foundationally are more different than humans and other primates in certain ways. In other ways, we're not, right? We look much more similar, right? But the core of certain systems are significantly, like so much mm -hmm. more than anybody could ever really imagine, different. <laughs> so, just so people get the idea, like, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, we split, male and female split a long, much, much longer time ago than humans from, uh, even humans from rodents, I mean, mammals. So anyway, <laughs> just expounding the point, just so people get it. Um, so anyway, male and female are different. And I know there's a lot of uh, 
debate about that today. But anyway, the point is that there's different recommendations for both. So according to traditional Ayurvedic medicine and understanding, the male energy system is more designed to thrive through discipline and overcoming of itself, whereas females are designed to thrive more through relaxation. This is something I've learned that really interested me from this uh, traditional knowledge. So men actually also are meant to wake up earlier naturally. For example, which this might sound really early for people, but from what I've learned and the, the doctor I work with is sort of an ideal embodiment of this, but we can wake up between three and four or five in the morning. And that's actually a really healthy time for men to wake up optimally, right? If, if we're in a really dial in circadian rhythm. Now, this might sound a bit odd because for some time I thought, oh, we should all wake up right around the time of the sunrise. But in fact, if you look at like monks or even really healthy elderly people, typically people wake up earlier. And also, if you look at humans, there's, I actually don't recall exactly where I've got this data. I'd have to go back and, and verify this. So people feel free. I want everything I share to be challenged thoroughly, just so people know. But anyway, people used to wake up earlier. I, I saw some evidence at one point that people actually woke up considerably earlier. And, you know, for example, 100 years ago than we do mm -hmm. today, like mm -hmm. we've really shifted forward. And it makes sense because we have artificial lights. We stay up later. We're on our phones. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so people used to wake up earlier like at, before the crack of dawn or at the crack of dawn. Now people sleep in seven, eight, nine. It's normal to wake up, you know, really late. But so anyway, it's important for men to wake up early. Women, it's actually apparently more important to rest and relax more. For men, according to Ayurvedic science, it's good to sleep on the hard floor. So I actually sleep often on like hard floor when I'm at my home in where I, well, it's not really home, but a base uh, where I've spent some time in the States. I actually don't have a bed. I just sleep on the, on the floor. And when I'm traveling, sometimes it's less convenient, but anyway, it's like, it's actually a way to sort of strengthen and discipline our energy system. And there's more resistance from the hard surfaces. So it's actually easier to sort of regenerate at a cellular level. Now, uh, for example, if you just are really tired, people maybe have experienced this before and you just lay on a hard floor. Sometimes it feels really good versus like laying on a really soft couch. There's some sort of something you get. So anyway, I haven't gotten really into your question. I'm going down tangents, but anyway, <laughs> so, so in the morning, once we wake up, I would say the first thing that's really important for people to do, whether you're a guy or girl, whether you're waking up earlier or later, ideally we're waking up earlier. And that happens through us eating our main meal of the day at an earlier time in the day. So for example, eating a main meal, like lunch and not a big dinner, because then our body can be more clean. So if you eat a massive heavy dinner, you're going to basically typically sleep in later and wake up feeling more sluggish. It's just people can experiment with this themselves. But typically, if you switch to eating, like I've noticed this personally now, I've done it for mm, two years or so. I And I'm not perfect with it, again, to be clear. But if I eat a big meal at like six or seven, I'm a completely different person when I wake up in the morning versus if I eat my main meal at like noon or one, and then I maybe have a lighter dinner. So I still had my nourishment for the day, but I had it when my body was most primed to break it down. And then I'm just having maybe something just, you know, kind of satiate my, my little appetite in the evening. Um, when I, I, my body's adjusted, so I'm not really usually like starving in the evening anyway. But so anyway, it makes a big difference. So, and that's one way, in addition to blocking blue light at night, which is obviously what my products do, you can, people can start to actually fall asleep earlier feeling again, clean. If they haven't eaten a massive meal, they've eaten maybe something lighter and then waking up earlier. So people can just experiment with this in their routine. But if you have your main meal around like noon or one at the latest, like that's your main lunch. And then you have dinner as a lighter type of food. And we can get into types of food if, if we want to a little bit later on, but people can see a huge difference. I'll bet anybody who, who experiments with this. And again, if you use raw optics, blue light blocking glasses from sunset to sleep, you'll also be more tired to fall asleep earlier as well. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, even with our glasses, and it's about time I put them on because the sun is uh, kind of descending here in, in Spain, but basically even with our glasses, if you're on your phone and I've, I've experimented with this enough myself to know that it, the, the light is a massive biological stimulus, but the sort of, let's say, nervous system stimulation of all the information, mm. uh, the content, the pictures, the information, the news or whatever, 
the glasses unfortunately cannot protect us from that. So yeah. at this point, I mean, they protect from, again, the physiological effects of the disruptive blue light. So like the worst bit of the screens, but they're not protecting from the toxic information or if it is toxic. And even if it's good information, if it's really exciting, mm -hmm. that's still not ideal if you want to get your nervous system and body winding down in the evening. So anyway, First thing in the morning, so we want to be waking up early, and that's why it's actually important for me to mention things to do to get the body into a state to fall asleep early, naturally, clean, ideally, like, as I've studied Ayurveda, the one of the uh, a beneficial thing, in fact, is to go to sleep with a little bit of an appetite, like not starving. But if you go to sleep, and you're like a little bit hungry, it's fine, you're not going to starve, you're not going to die in your sleep, like, but you can wake up feeling like I'm ready for the day, like with hunger, and hunger you know, these things seem to be uh, more and more apparent as I'm as I'm learning in life, like hunger in the physical sense and hunger in the emotional sense, like the energy, like being hungry mm. for, for life are much more closely related than I've realized. Like for, for a long time, I was, you know, and, and still still sometimes as I'm traveling, I'm so fortunate that I have abundance of food and great food in different places. But I can definitely notice like if I'm kind of constantly indulging myself, I, I actually feel more full, of course, physically, but I also don't feel quite as much of that, like a hunger to like mm. go after life in a way. Cause you know, like the fat and happy syndrome and yeah, nothing I agree. wrong with that necessarily. But so there is something to be said and I'm exper experimenting with this more and more. And it's, it's, it's a challenge for me cause I love food and I love eating, yeah. but to, to actually discipline myself to, uh, be hungry more often. And again, this flies in the face of I have friends who are all about like bodybuilding and they're like, eat, train as much as you can, eat as much as you can. If you're training a ton and then through that, you're hungry a lot, then that's great too. Like, you know, being hungry, you don't just have to eat less to be hungry. Yeah. You could also just train more and be more active. Like I went and walked for this reason. I went and walked a month across Northern Spain, which was, I guess, right after we had spoken last time. And I walked uh, approximately 550 miles in 30 days. It's a famous Christian or Catholic pilgrimage in Northern Spain called the Camino de Santiago to the wow. final resting place of St. James, the apostle. So anyway, in Northern Spain. So anyway, really, but that was part of the, the, the main intention behind that was like to be more hungry, like to just, you know, do something that was really going to exert myself where I would like, no matter how much food I ate, I'd be hungry, but not just in the, uh, the sense of food, but in the sense of like doing something that's, getting out into the world. And, you know, because at 24 years old, I think like guys in history would be fighting wars, like doing all kinds of, you know, really hard stuff. And I'm like, I'm sitting on my laptop, you know, I have to figure <laughs> out how to incorporate more, That's true. you know, something like <clears throat> intense and in, in, intense and in, in not in a negative way, but you get the idea. So anyway, yeah. when you wake up in the morning, I recommend people do, I'll, I'll kind of tighten up the, the rest of this just so people, you know, you guys can ask some more questions and then we can, yeah, wrap up in a reasonable time frame. But basically I recommend people practice some kind of meditation in the morning. So now this is again to each their own, right? I'm not here to tell people which religion to follow or spiritual path, but in my experience, well, the, the, first of all, the evidence is clear or the, the anecdotal evidence and the historical evidence that throughout history, people meditated in the morning and prayed because it's the most quiet, like according to the Hindu knowledge and the Ayurvedic knowledge, at least from India, this this time in the morning is what's called like sattvic time, it's peaceful, it's quiet. And this is the same in Chinese medicine. So if we just look at the East and what they're saying, it's a time which is best for internal work, you know, breathing exercise, meditation, prayer, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, connecting with God connecting with spirit, and so on. So that based on my personal research and experience, it's, it's a great time to build that foundation for the day. And according to the Ayurvedic knowledge, whatever foundation we build in that morning time is our foundation for the whole day. So if we have a really great, for example, meditation or prayer or connection, then that might be, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, depending on somebody's practice, maybe a few hours, but then even a five or 10 minute meditation or breathe, you know, breather or prayer later on can reconnect us back to that foundation that we establish in the morning. So it's really important not to just, and I'm so guilty of wanting to wake up in the morning. First thing I want to do is try to like 
answer as many emails as I possibly can from like the bed to my computer. Like I just want to within, you know, that's my, what I want to do. But Mm -hmm. if I look at how my days go, if I just get up and immediately go into emails, it's almost like, it's just not the right foundation for my day. I, I, I feel like a sort of stress from the beginning, right. Versus Mm -hmm. really getting like calm. uh, I've studied a good amount under Dr. Joe Dispenza, just following his work. And he's somebody who's teaching a lot about the science behind meditation and the psychology, the neuroscience of change. And one of, one of the most interesting concepts he's, he's shared for me is that if we wake up every day and we don't choose to be defined by a vision of the future, by who we want to be that day, then we're automatically going to be defined by the memories of the past because of the way our brain works and ought, we automatically react to people, places, and things, and so on in our environment, he says, in the same way, if we haven't taken that chance to choose consciously how we're going to react. Because the science is clear that mental rehearsal, so like mentally rehearsing something, even if you don't physically play the piano, there are studies showing that if you mentally rehearse the scales, that you're taught the correct way to do them, and you just do it in your head, you don't even move your fingers, that you can actually do it better when you go and play. Or even... Mm-hmm. There was a study on uh, participants pretending they were lifting, doing uh, curls with a dumbbell, like bicep curls, and they actually grew their muscle without actually ever moving their arms just by imagining it. So, Mm. and I I do believe this completely based on the science of energy that I've studied about bioelectromagnetism, this field, these books I was studying as I got into this information, because ultimately if we can, well, that... The science of bioelectromagnetism lays the foundation in Western science for this. Now, Western science, unfortunately, hasn't gone further. But in Qigong and in ancient Chinese practices and in the, again, the Hindu or Ayurvedic uh, practices, there's, and also in certain Christian practices as well, you know, everybody's a part, I guess, in the party in some way. But we we can actually direct our energy towards certain parts of our body and give that part of our body energy. Like this is a, the Qi Gong and Tai Chi. Right? So it's not that far fetched for me to think that those studies make sense, right? Because well, they do this. Yeah. If you've ever done a workout and literally the instructor is telling you, hey, visualize this section of your body contracting, you lift way, be- way bigger. I mean, that can be practiced just immediately. I know I've seen that. It's like, hey, um, think about the muscle group that you're about to to activate. And then Bam. Like, yeah. it, it's just, it, to me, that makes total sense. Yeah. Well, so, and I'm, you know, it's good too, is that even though we haven't gone through the whole day, we've actually started with the most important thing by far, which is how to set yourself up in the, in the previous day or yeah. in the current day, let's say yeah. to wake up early because it, hmm. our actions the day before have such a big impact on the next day. And I, I heard on a podcast or some clip recently, like somebody said, you know, going out or dr- drinking alcohol is like basically borrowing happiness or stealing happiness from the next day. Like, cause it's kind of what it is, right? But if we make the right decisions in the day before, then we can wake up earlier feeling more fresh and have a clearer mental state and be able to execute significantly better. Like if I eat late and stay up late and do all kinds of things, I might wake up at like seven or even sometimes later, which for me is like really late for me. I don't like waking up that late, but if I'm doing everything right and I'm on my like grind, let's say, but in my routine and dialed in, I might wake up at five. I might even wake up some days earlier. And like the amount of things I can get done in addition to doing a meditation and some kind of spiritual practice and prayer, even before seven or 8 a.m., if I'm up at four, is unbelievable. And there's like this, these books, the 5 a.m. club and all this people talking about like how it's the secret weapon is to wake up that early. And I completely believe it. But in order to do that, just using an alarm every day is a recipe for burnout. Yeah. If you do it naturally by, again, not eating a massive heavy meal late in the day and going to sleep early enough and not being on your phone the last two hours before bed, but actually having a tea, reading a book or whatever, that's, that's critical. So then waking up in the morning, and, and so just back to what we were talking about with the idea of intentionally, like mentally rehearsing you know, who you're going to be, and this is, again, credit to Dr. Joe Dispenza for this concept, if people can mentally rehearse who they're going to be and how they're going to react to certain situations – uh, in, in a positive or elevated, a greater way than previously, mm-hmm. then instead of just waking up, so like me going to my emails, for example, I can see how if I wake up and I go straight in my email inbox, there are going to be emails that 
I'm going to react to in a way that's part of a program of how I have, like just, just trying to get it all done or just, and maybe even reacting and responding. But the issue with, and, and that's unfortunately like a very limited consciousness for me that I'll, I'll, some, I'll often do our limited expression of my consciousness. But then the thing is, I'm not even realizing when I respond to that email, they're just going to respond tomorrow. So I'm just going to have the same thing to deal with tomorrow. So it's like an immediate <laughs> example in my personal life for me of how if I don't choose to elevate my consciousness, then I'm going to keep living the same life over and over again, reacting to the same things and having to deal with the same problems until I'm like, wait a minute, get out of the re uh, wanting to jump in and react in the same way. Say, wait a minute, what would I do? Let's just say, what would I do if I were a billionaire? Or what would I do if I were in my ideal role, like a CEO of my company, not dealing with everything I probably should delegate to my team, not trying to handle it all myself, but actually delegating. Then I can go to my emails from a higher level and actually permanently solve problems by passing them to the right person or saying, no, this isn't a good focus right now. Again, I'm only using this example because for me, it illustrates really well. And I think everybody can find their own version of this in their life, but how just choosing to like not get into that. I want to react and just knock things out. And I have that tendency almost every day. I feel that pull. I want to do it. And I've been pretty good recently about resisting. So anyway, setting a strong meditation or prayer foundation for the day, even if somebody only has 10 minutes to sit and be like, okay, let me just be here with myself for a little bit. I think it's really important for people to center themselves before jumping into their day. And mm -hmm. then people might naturally want to build that up. And then of course we can get into the concept of, you know, what I call the light diet. And this is part of the light diet. That step I would consider cultivating our inner light. So that's one of the key pieces and they're not in a particular order uh, as I'm sharing them here, but then we would want to expose ourselves to morning sunlight. And this is something that the science is super clear on. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but before we move on, is there anything you guys want to kind of unpack here further? No, just that, you know, I think if anyone's honest with themselves, everything you just said has checked out in a personal way. Mm -hmm. Like I've had weeks where I start it by reading scripture and then praying. And I've had weeks where I started by answering DMs and emails. And you you know the difference. I mean, you, you can feel it and your kids know. Mm -hmm. If you have kids, like, wow, mom's energy is different. Um, I, I think that makes sense. I think yeah, the the morning time, the start of your day is is a wonderful opportunity to center yourself. Um, I I love the point you said about hey, let's talk about blue light and how to mitigate its effects um, physiologically, but let's also talk about the mental stimulus of the information within our devices. That could be the TV, your phone, your computer, um, probably even loud music. You know, any of that I think could be uh, another point to the conversation of, yeah, yeah, you could biohack your way and, and put on your blue light blocking glasses and still be on your phone at night and think you're doing a good job. But what about that information you're taking in? What about that comment that you read that made you kind of mad? And then now you're thinking about it at night and I have a hard time falling asleep and you wake up the next morning groggy and, and you, you know, like it, it's a, Again, this whole conversation comes back to like, there's deeper levels here. Mm -hmm. There are deeper levels. So I love that. I love the cultivating your kind of grounding in the morning. And then, yeah, I want to I want to talk about um, what you were just saying about getting your sunlight in the morning. I think that's super practical. I'd love to hear how you do that in the wintertime too. So I say let's keep rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the idea with morning sunlight is simply that it really sets our body's circadian rhythm. So, and again, the science is massive on this now. Dr. Huberman, Andrew Huberman, if I imagine you guys are familiar, but yeah. mm -hmm. he's blown up talking about the science as have several other people talking about this, but he's one of the bigger ones. And, and I think deservedly so it's, it's critical information that the world needs with the science, you know, the scientific backing is, Great, because that's the the level that people are at, especially like a primarily predominantly atheist society that we live in. People believe science. Well, science, it's not a belief. Science is the new God for most yeah. people. So yeah. science is, is, you know, what people have used. The idea that to me, let's see. Science means in Latin to know, like skire means to know. And so science comes from the concept, the, the word to know. So the idea is that we can know something through experimentation. And 
that's basically what science does, right? The premise of science is you have a hypothesis or a theory, and then you have to develop an experiment to try to disprove your hypothesis. Technically, you're not supposed to try to prove anything. You're just supposed to try to disprove something. And if you can't disprove it enough, then it might eventually become you know, a theory and then maybe even a law if, if it's really so clear. So the thing is that all scientific analysis, yes, we use, uh, you know, scientists use equipment and devices and all types of machines to attempt to basically analyze this information. But at the end, at the end of the day, in science, humans are still the ones developing the methodology of an experiment. We are the ones you know, organizing the experiments, setting the variables. Humans are running the experiments, conducting the experiments, even if there's like, you know, double blind or triple blind, you know, so, so there's, let's say bias is kind of taken out of the equation, which is critical. And then humans are analyzing the data that maybe a machine has collected and analyzed first, but humans are ultimately the ones analyzing it. So it's like, what I'm trying to say is that the, I, the way science is practiced, at least at present, and the only way that I could see it being practiced going forward, uh, unless maybe AI could change this potentially, the, the computer god that, that seems to be emerging, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it still all comes down to the human perception. In other words, our assumption in science, the assumption in science is that our perception is it, that there's nothing greater than human perception. And that this is, and, and for, for most intents and purposes in our world, it, it's a fair assumption because we're talking about things that we see, that we perceive, that we deal with. And so we're trying to get information that can make our lives and our world better. So it makes sense. But what I'm attempting to point out is that the, the very core of science is still limited to human consciousness, which is limited. Mm -hmm. compared to, let's say, cosmic consciousness or greater consciousness or what some might call God. And so I, you know, I made the comment earlier that I think scientists have tried to replace God with a microscope. And, you know, I, I was raised atheist uh, for the most part. I mean, I grew up in a pretty atheist kind of culture and I accepted this for a long time. Like I thought God was just like a stupid idea, like a white guy with a beard who's just like waving a wand and making things happen, you know, like just... It's like, I believe in science. I don't that's believe That's a wizard. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. That's like, that's what, that was kind of the perception that, that I was raised with and, and yeah. that so many people are today. Mm -hmm. And in my own personal journey, at least and now I know I'm not quite answering your question exactly, but this is just pointing out the limits of, of science in, in, in my opinion. Uh, and, and although it's again, very valuable, but also limited at the same time, just like many things, almost everything, there's certain pros and cons. I came to realize that no, you know, no amount of science and all the things I was doing with my diet and my life were based on quote unquote science, but no amount of science was ultimately like going to make me happy. For example, like mm. I took the science, the most advanced science. I mean, six years before Huberman and people like this came on the scene, mm -hmm. I was using the same information to try to optimize my dopamine and all this and still not feeling really whole inside. And it wasn't until I started actually studying the science of meditation and neuroscience of, uh, yeah, change and so on. And actually practicing letting go of myself, this concept of letting go of like my, who I think I am, my limited identity for something greater that I actually started feeling how I was wanting to feel the whole time, but it didn't come through any of this other stuff. So all that's to say, I personally believe there are lots of limits to science and, and what it can show us. That being said, at the same time, yeah, if you can run an experiment with people and humans and find certain mechanisms and see that, oh, if they, you know, expose themselves to morning sunlight, then it turns out they actually sleep better in the evening compared to those who don't, well, then let's use it, right? If it's, if it's useful and, and practical and makes sense for us, or even if it's inconvenient, but it shows something we should know, then great. So anyway, morning sunlight, this is so important. Morning sunlight is something we should be exposed to for 10 to 15 minutes every day to set our body's circadian rhythm. It stimulates the release of key hormones, neurotransmitters and something. And it's uh, all of these things. And it's just, it's so, to, it, it's part of my life. It's been part of my life for like eight years, nine years now, but 
it should be a part of everyone's life in my opinion like just going outside you if you have a big window you can kind of put your head like toward the window or out the window you have to open it though but like i i don't really recommend people go too close far to the window because if somebody falls out of their window and gets hurt you know i don't think that's a good idea better just like go outside um closed windows don't have the same effect and again the reason i say get get close to your window or walk out on your balcony or your terrace because when you're inside the amount of light is so much less even if it doesn't look like it than when you actually go outside and the lights all around you it's, there's yeah. much more intensity so this is something people can do. And again, 10, 15 minutes in the morning is sufficient to have this effect. Although ideally, for example, you asked about the winter, Liz. So in the winter, I generally recommend what I do is just go out for like an hour walk or even I'll go run, for example, or people sh can bike. But if you're walking, you're usually not as cold than if you're just as if yeah. you're sitting there. Mm -hmm. But you can get so much more exposure. And the, the doctor I work with on our product development at my company he, he is one of the leading experts in this field in the world and in photobiology, how light affects health. And he said the average person should have two hours of unfiltered daylight every day. Mm. So wow. like that might be a one hour walk in the morning, even in the winter and a one hour walk in the afternoon or an hour and a half in the morning and, or an hour walk in the morning and have a window open near your desk. If you can, even if it's a little cold, put on a hoodie, you know, let the full spectrum of light come in because glass filters out important wavelengths that mm. are beneficial to our body basically. That's good. What about um, so I'm thinking a, 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 I'm thinking through my day and the lights that are surrounding me. So obviously wearing a glass protection if you don't say you have artificial lights in your house, which ninety most one hundred percent of us do, does. yeah, or in your office building or in your school or whatever. Um, I've heard you talk about the lenses and like how you just said a window, which is clear, blocks some of the lights. What about the clear versions of the blue light blocking glasses? How do those stack up to more of a tinted, like the ones I'm wearing, which are bright yellow? The yeah. ones you have on, I think, are they orange. They block nothing. <laughs> they block nothing. Even though you can see that. the blue reflection? Yeah, it's like 1% or 2%. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I shouldn't say nothing, but nothing for most, all intents and purposes. Um, it is, so they block a range of blue light up to 400 five nanometers so blue light doesn't really even start until around there but they block technically it's ultraviolet and violet indigo light it's not even really in the blue range but the colors are just kind of names we give to the different i mean we see them and we give names yeah. to different wavelengths but where the wavelengths of light activate the uh circadian rhythm the most is around 470 to 480 nanometers and so this in this range these lenses block nothing and in the range that our screens emit these lenses block virtually nothing as well so like blue light goes from around 400 500 nanometers approximately they block about 100 percent up to 400 i should say up to 420 not 405 so they'll block up to 420 but then beyond that it's very little now mm -hmm. again the main peak of modern leds is around 450 nanometers and so if you're blocking everything up to 420, but then very little by the time you get to 450 nanometers, and I have some videos on YouTube, like clear lens, blue light glasses exposed. People can look this up and see. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It basically, sh I show that these lenses, they don't block the, the big spike of blue light that comes off of our screens, which is a risk both for retinal health. It can damage our eyes. It's a risk for hormonal health. It can disrupt our hormones. And it's a risk for our circadian rhythm, sleep, melatonin production, and therefore overall health. Because when you disrupt melatonin and the circadian rhythm, you disrupt sleep and repair quality, and you also disrupt overall health. So mm -hmm. it, it is an issue. And again, the clear lenses, they don't block this. So how to say it, it's a, they're, they're a huge gimmick. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're hoping that with you know our work with people like Huberman and some other leading scientists that we're able to expose the truth, you know, scientists who, who care about the truth, hopefully can help us uh, bring the truth out. But I've measured so many of these different lenses that are clear and they don't block any significant amount of this light. So maybe I can give you a demonstration. Just stand by for a second. I'm yeah. sure I can give you a demonstration that you would appreciate. So let's I mean it makes sense, right? There being like clear and tinted being different. I mean just logically. Yeah, totally. It, it yeah, it's filtering light 
through color, it, yeah. which is light. <laughs> I know. know. Yeah, you, yeah, you wouldn't put clear shades up. No. It's, yeah, it makes sense to me. I love it. All right. This is going to be fun. So if you're listening to this pod, is this going to be a video on YouTube or something? Yeah, hopefully. Okay. We have YouTube. Without it, then this demonstration is purposeless. No, <laughs> so, we'll, we'll put you on YouTube. So uh, YouTube would be good. And if you're listening to the audio, you're just going to have to get on YouTube right now. And if you're driving, don't try to get on YouTube. Just wait till you get home. Yep. But so basically, I'm just going to point this. I'm going to turn off the blue light blocking from my computer right now. And I'm going to put up a white note so that I have a full white screen. And I'm going to take this. So I have a spectrometer here, a handheld spectrometer. Oh, that's cool. That's cool, right? And then I'll point it at the screen and show you what the, it's going to be RGB. So you have red, green, blue. Mm -hmm. That's the light that comes off the screen. Mm -hmm. Now, this, so the clear lenses, they block blue light up to 420 nanometers. But do you oh, see yeah. any blue light coming off the screen below 420 no. or above? Yeah. There's none. So it's they if they block that great, if you're trying to protect from sunlight, which I don't think is a great idea based on my knowledge and beliefs about the benefits of sunlight, I don't recommend overdosing on sun, but I don't think it's as bad as most people think. So anyway, you're not going to have the benefit from protecting from screens because there's no protection if you're blocking mm -hmm. 420 nanometers. If you want to block sunlight, great, but those lenses could help, but again, so anyway, just showing that one more time, so people can get a picture. That's what the L and the changes in the RGB, red, green, blue, is what causes all the different colors in the screen. So if I point not at the white note, but if I point at you guys, let's just say, for example, let's see how different it is. So the blue is actually less than when it's, mm. but anyway, yeah, that's that. That's now, awesome. obviously, like this is a representation of a bunch of like much smaller pixels moving mm -hmm. that make up the images. Like if I pointed at your red shirt right now, let me just try that. I bet I'm going to get a lot more red. See, so check that out. Just aiming that at your red shirt. Oh, yeah. Those are the colors coming off the screen to represent your red shirt right now. So I'm going to go back to the white note. That was just, yeah. So anyway, the white blank page, white note. Now, if I take, so I recently... Oh, Oops. I recently purchased a pair of clear lens blue light blocking glasses for this purpose of demonstration. So these are a, a leading brand and you see that flashy blue coating. I'm sure you can yep, see it pretty well right there. I can there. see it. That's just an anti-reflective coating. So like all, most glasses have that. We use a oh. green one because when you look at green, it's a lot less annoying and more pleasurable for the person who's looking at you than seeing this annoying blue, but that's part of the marketing gimmick. So anyway, this is from a company called Hoya. It's one of the largest eyewear manufacturers in the world. And it's like blue protect is the name of the product. And it's, it's this, so I'm going to hold this just like this. This is how oh, I, I see. Yes. Yeah. And then I'm pointing it at the screen. So I'm just pointing this, but now I have to point at the screen, not through at the, the lens yeah, of through the lens. The... Exactly. So we can mm -hmm. see what the lens filter. So remember this is before blue lights, very high the blue yeah. light. It's like there it's almost to the top tick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's exact. It's like exactly the same. Yeah, it didn't change much. No. So I'll do one more just of the screen. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's why I am not protected from any of the blue light from the screen right now. Even mm -hmm. if so, if people say why it works. Well, it's placebo effect. Have you tested it through yours? What What would well, you, that's what I'm you do now? Now you get the fun part. So. Which now ones do you have this, on? I, oh, these the are the yellow lens. daylight lenses. Yeah. That's what I have on right yeah, now too. Yeah, exactly. Although it's just sun has just pretty much set and it's just getting dark. So once we get off the phone, I'll switch. But so this is what I'm doing, but I'm pointing it up against the screen, mm -hmm. the white part. Okay. So now. Oh, now. oh wow. There's no, there, no that's, that peak is gone. Oh, isn't that great? Now oh, I, have you done this on Instagram? You know, this I exact thing should, but I'm just, uh, you should yeah, do it and tag us, but we'll, you we'll, literally we'll, we'll just tell you what though. We have this clip now, the efficacy, we have this clip now. And when Leanne watches this, she's going to know, um, she'll see this. She'll clip it out for us. We'll post it. We'll post this. Yeah, yeah. We're, 
I'll, I'll start. I'm gonna start doing. I'm gonna start doing spectrometer demonstration. You know, just probably because of you guys, I'll just go on Instagram right now and do one after this. But so, but so anyway, back to the white. Well, that's it's um it's pretty significant. I mean, I'll just uh, test the red lenses just so you can see. Yeah, please. So you can do. see what the sunset lenses do. It's, it's pretty. Yeah, anyone listening that's not gonna watch it, it's it's pretty outstanding how completely eliminated the red. Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh. Oh, it's all red. Now yeah, the that's beautiful. Gone, basically, yeah. uh, not all the green's gone. In fact, there's still a little bit, and that's intentional. But uh, so that you can still have a little bit better color perception with these than if we just cut it all completely. Yeah, yes, it is. So, it is kind of hard. And, and like, if you wear them, they cut out the color. That's the thing. So oh. you're trade. You're making a trade off. The color that we see that helps us to see has another effect that it actually stimulates the blue in particular. It stimulates our those wavelengths stimulate our nervous system and our hormonal system and our circadian system. So in the mm -hmm. evening, the scientist, I work with Dr. Alexander Wunsch, um, who, if you guys ever want to have like a, a pure light genius on the show, that's the guy. Um, so <laughs> it'd be really cool. But anyway, That'd be fun. so he, he basically told me in the evening, if you can see a lot of colors, you're probably seeing too much light in general. And it makes sense. Again, considering that in the evening, we would really not have a lot of color vision. We would maybe have fire at most, but again, that's very yellow, orange, red. So anyway. Based Joe, on that demonstration, regardless of what you believe blue light or all kinds of lights do to you, which I'm hoping through the education of this podcast, your beliefs are at least your appetite for, for understanding what it can do for you has at least been peaked. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're interested. Yeah. Um, but clearly, right. There is a filtration effect of wearing, and I think you would be crazy to not believe that some filtration effect can happen from wearing glasses of the light that enters into your, like, it would, it would be insane not to believe that. Cause like, it's that, a lens. that's how it works. Right. Right. But oh my gosh, the impact of clear versus tinted was hilariously different. Here's my anecdotal evidence. Um, when I would wear my red ones at night, my nighttime glasses, um, and then uh, when our youngest was waking up and I'd have to go upstairs in her room, I would take my glasses off because her room is dark. And we have shades, and so her, her room is very dark. I promise you the second I took off those red glasses, I could see everything in her room, not color, but shape-wise versus if I had just come upstairs from maybe watching the TV and had all this stimulating light, I'd walk in her dark room and be like, I can't see anything. Yeah. I swear to you, it gave me like supervision in the nighttime because I could actually perceive shapes and the subtle amount of light coming in from the moon because I hadn't like almost dampened my response mm. with the influx of nighttime yeah. light. It was mm -hmm. like, yeah. It was so cool, and I I remember I remember DMing uh, Dr. Courtney Kayla because she's the one who introduced me to you, and I was like, Courtney, I have super night vision, and I was like, Have you ever experienced this? And she was like, No, I need to try it. So, um, for any moms out there who are like squinting, trying to go check on their little ones because they, they don't want to turn a light on, yeah. um, but they want to comfort their little child as they're trying to fall asleep, man, that's wear funny. those red light glasses because yeah. those are. And that's also why, like, uh, for example, on boat and so on and like headlamps and you know for hunters like the indicators are red because it doesn't disrupt your night vision in the same way that and that's like that's a separate effect from the uh circadian rhythm disruption but they're in some way related in other words like one is one is affecting our non-visual systems so our circadian rhythm our sleep the other is affecting our visual system yeah but they're they're coming from a similar a similar cause so anyway um, uh, this is, I love that. This is good. So I would say we've covered as far as like how to make this information practical. Like again, what I call the light diet in somebody's daily routine, daily life, really looking at, you know, how they're, if we're looking at setting yourselves up for success to have a really, you know, waking up early, being focused, having a lot of mental clarity and so on, then looking at, you know, during the day getting that morning sunlight in the morning, like having, it's, it's almost like it's a never ending cycle. But if we start from the morning, it's like having, no matter what time you wake up, having a great, you know, time to center yourself, getting that morning sunlight exposure, being outdoors as much as you can throughout the day, which is of course easier in the summer, but you can still do it in the winter. Like I'm also in Spain in Northern Spain. It's getting cold. It's like in the probably fifties on average, forties, some days, a little lower some days, but mm -hmm. it's not freezing yet, but 
still chilly. Um, but I'm just, you know, wearing a hoodie and oh, keeping the windows open and getting the exposure, not all the time, but anyway, so then just getting plenty of exposure to artificial or not artificial natural daylight. Right. And then, uh, eating, eat with the sun is one of the core components of the light diet. So basically mm. eating when basically what is indicated by nature and by, again, the traditional Eastern philosophies, which are now being backed up more and more by the Western science, which is that we definitely should eat our heaviest meal in the evening or especially at night or late. And the later we do, the worse it is, but better, it's better to actually eat in the middle of the day. Like if, if you wake up and first thing right after waking up, you eat a massive heavy breakfast, like you're probably going to feel sluggish, right? It's yeah. like, but if you eat, wake up and fast, usually by like 12, 11, 12, or even 10, maybe 11, 12, you're going to be hungry, generally speaking, if you're active or, you know, unless you had like feasting the previous days or like good, maybe more food than you need. I've also found that we need a lot less food than we think, at least in my personal experience, hmm. practicing these different things. Um, which again, as I mentioned, I love eating in general. I love food, but it's just part of the, the learning process, you know, optimal for optimal health. The research is clear. There's one number one uh, most proven effect for life extension in animals is calorie restriction. So mm. th like, there's no real solid debate against that eating less is good for us. And so the thing is, for some people, eating less is like really difficult. They feel like they're starving themselves. But for if you I, I'm sure that if people apply these principles, at least it's, it's had a, a strong effect for me, like you won't be as hungry uh, in general. Like if you're getting daylight, exposing yourself to daylight, balancing your energy, not living in chronic stress and survival, you can help to regulate your appetite and benefit your appetite and so on. Uh, and, you know, anyway, so then eating with the sun and then come afternoon. So again, combining the science of circadian rhythms and the, the ancient wisdom and knowledge of Ayurvedic science the afternoon is a time for us to start to chill out, right? So because of my time change to the United States, of course, we're doing a podcast and it's now my almost evening, it's almost six here. But in general, you know, I make my afternoon time to relax, to start winding down, maybe to see friends. Like my morning is like my, almost like my war time. Like I wake up, not war time, but you know what I mean? Like peace time, mm -hmm. active peace time. Like I'm going to be in my routine. I'm going to get work done. I'm going to train. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to, you know, not quite in that order, meditate first, but do all these things so that then by, cause I like that feeling by two or three in the afternoon. I'm like, I did really well today. I could work more or I could kind of just take it a little easier. N me being me and being single and traveling, like I have a lot of free time. So if I don't go out to like explore wherever I am that day, then I'll probably just work but I have to typically like force cut myself off by six or seven. Sometimes I will literally just work until like nine, which for me, sometimes I work later, but for me, like nine's already really late for other people. Nine's like early for me. I want to be asleep at nine. I want to be mm -hmm. in like bed at eight or eight 30 generally speaking. And so if I'm working till nine, I'm like not going to sleep till 10 probably. So anyway, uh, but in general, it takes, it takes discipline. Like it's not easy, but you have to, I, I, when I, when I just stop at like five or six or seven and I have tea and chill read maybe, or hang out with a friend, then I definitely notice that I'm waking up in a better state. Even let's say not irrespective of my food choices, but if I, even if I make the right choice with food and I have a bigger lunch and a lighter dinner, uh, or even like a afternoon snack and no food, which I'll, you know, no dinner, which I often do as well. If I'm on my phone, stimulating my brain till nine, then I'm maybe still going to wake up later feeling more sluggish. Like last night, I'm guilty of watching this amazing and hilarious uh, interview Elon did with uh, the New York Times or something. It was hilarious. It was so funny. He basically called out the the advertisers for boycotting uh Twitter or X advertising. It's hilarious. I, I saw that. It was ridiculous. Did you see, did you see the video? The whole oh, thing? Yeah, I did. Not the entire thing. I saw the clips of him essentially in a very profane way saying it, like, I don't it, care. Like, you could, why? G yeah. it actually, he just said the GFY like acronym. But anyway, so um, the afternoon is indicated as a time to rest and take it easy and relax. And especially the evening, you know, like, so even if you, let's just say, 
if you're me and you don't have a family that you're going to go spend time with in the afternoon hours or whatever, like, okay, I might be able to work until six or seven, but it's not wise to, for me to work later because again, then I'm stimulating my nervous system. I'm going to affect my sleep negatively and actually ultimately eat away or take away from my next day, the quality of my regeneration, waking up early, fresh, et cetera. So that's pretty much it. And if we're going to talk about the types of foods, I mean, I, I don't really, I, I avoid getting in food recommendations for anyone, but, but what I would say is for people who are like meat eaters and, you know, people who are eating like heavy proteins, probably best to have these types of things at lunch because our body is going to be able to digest them better. But the other thing is that eating, um, eating raw food is also according to Ayurvedic medicine, not recommended in the evening either because if you eat like a big salad it takes a lot more digestive energy to break down believe it or not like raw vegetables yeah. than like cooked vegetables so like mm -hmm. cooked vegetable stew or cooked vegetables is something that's like really easy to digest but it'll make people feel sated so that might be like an optimal dinner choice again just one example uh also things like legumes uh these types of things are heavier actually they take more digestive energy that's you know people joke about beans giving you gas but like it would be better just like heavy proteins like meats to have legumes in the middle of the day. So, mm. uh, so yeah, anyway, that's kind of the summary. I think we've covered most of the day from like the morning, spending mm -hmm. time outside. We haven't talked a ton about sunbathing, but we can do another episode on that. But sunbathe people, it's great for you. Just don't overdo it. That's the short of it, to be honest, but seriously, don't sunburn. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, there's, I have a lot more podcasts and information on that. We're working on a updated version of the light diet course um, that, I put out for people to who want to get more information and me talking about some of the science and the application. But in general, I think if anybody took just like even some of what we shared, the key things of, you know, eating their bigger meal in the middle of the day, if they can, and not, if you eat dinner, then at least if, if you have to have a big dinner, because whatever you're away at work, then maybe try to have it at five or six and not at eight, you know, mm. it'll feel a big difference. And then, yeah, getting up in the morning, practicing something, whether it's, again, a prayer, meditation, some kind of energy practices. Some people do Qigong or Tai Chi or Pranayama or some breathing, whatever. Morning's a great time to do that so that you can set yourself up so we can all set ourselves up for success to go into our day and bring a, a higher energy. And then from there, we're off to the races. Like I use my morning, I didn't mention this, but I use my morning right after meditation as the best time to work and focus. Like uh, I've seen a guy on Twitter or X recently named Alex Hormozzi. Maybe you've seen him. He's a really great uh, entrepreneur kind of figure and educator. Anyway, great content. But he, he's he been uh, kind of, and maybe he's done this for a long time. I've just seen him recently, but kind of ripping on the concept of like the people who have their superstitious, like three hour morning routine. And they're like, if I don't do my three hour morning routine, like I'm useless for the whole day, you know? And because there's this kind of culture now about that. He's like, what if you just worked instead, you know, <laughs> like what if you just did your work? And so it's funny, but that's fortunately to the, from the advice and direction of my Ayurvedic doctor, who's an, an, let's say mentor in this, in this field of Ayurvedic medicine, he shared with me that, and this is also, again, what the Western science is saying, to be clear, our cognition is the sharpest in the morning. Our cognition mm -hmm. is by far the sharpest, like four to 8 AM. And it just goes off a cliff as you get later in the day. So if we, if we work in those, so I do meditation, work, and then go train after like an hour or two of really focused work, some kind of training or activity. Now, some days I'll work much longer. Another thing that's really simple and almost obvious and people talk about it, but maybe don't emphasize how important it is. And I haven't even practiced it really thoroughly until like the last two weeks, but taking a break every hour from work, like, so never working more than an hour straight it's almost astounding because people think, oh, like, what's it really going to do for me if I just take a five minute break? It's not really going to do anything. But there's actually emerging, you know, more and more evidence. And there's already some research on this, but that if we work for more than an hour, basically our brain, and it might be like 50 minutes or 55 minutes. I don't have the exact number in my head, but basically beyond that, that range, our cognition just goes off a cliff. Like our, our cognitive function in general, just falls. But if we take a five or 10 minute break, walk around, breathe fresh air, maybe even just lay down and just breathe or chill or something, talk to somebody, whatever, play with your kids, great opportunity to play with kids, you know, if you're working from home and remotely or whatever, and then come back, you can actually be super productive, like over. So 
that's what I've been leveraging recently to be able to be more productive, even if I'm working for three or four hours straight, like a five to 10 minute break, but I have to actually set an alarm. Otherwise I won't do it or I'll forget about it. But cause I've, I'll, I've also for the past six years, I just done the thing where I just sit and work for three hours straight until I have a headache and my brain hurts. Even if I was wearing my blue light blocking glasses, again, they're not going to protect me from being dumb and overworking and straining my eyes at mm-hmm. a screen for three hours. Right? Yeah. They help, but they help from they they make the difference between a really bad headache and very subtle, more subtle fatigue mm-hmm. brain fatigue mm-hmm. but either way you can the, the glasses just make it a lot more relaxing but they're not going to like prevent you from doing dumb things in general i mean they'll boost your dopamine level by helping your sleep and everything so you will do fewer dumb things in general but <laughs> the glasses aren't a cure all they just help a lot mhm oh, i love that <laughs> I think it's like wearing a helmet, but it's like if you're riding a motorcycle, something can still go sideways. Totally. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think um, a lot of what you said is just uh, like when your body is able to optimize everything, then things work better. Like for you, not eating as much as maybe you previously were, it's probably because your body is able to maximize the nutrition you are getting. Um, and that's going to be tailored to every single person. If you might be in a stage where you need to eat a lot because your body is not efficient with that intake and you have to compensate for that fuel need. And so, yeah, I just, I, I think that that's really interesting. I think that you're clearly in a state right now where that is working for you. And I think that that to me logically makes sense in my head of like, Hey, you're optimizing your body on all these different levels. And therefore you're able to see how eating, um, uh, easy to digest lighter dinner. I even think like the broth stew example is such a classic Mm -hmm. evening meal that it it makes sense. It's also very soothing, very warm. I know that like for women, different stages of their cycle, they should be leaning towards more warm, warming foods than the cold, you know, salads and the smoothies. So there's all of this can be intertwined. And if you want to nerd out, you can go on a million different rabbit trails, right? Down a million different holes, whatever the saying there is. <laughs> I don't really yes. know. But, but you're following a rabbit somewhere. You're down a hole on a trail. You know, a rabbit. Alice in Wonderland. But it's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's call me Alice. But the, the, I think the, the, the biggest takeaway I'm taking from this conversation is one, I think practically just our family, we could instill like an evening tea time. I think we could shut off all of our lights, mm-hmm. light some candles and like have some tea with our kids. Cause I think even getting them to wind down and showing them like, Hey, we're setting up for tomorrow. This is a really good practice and just have some conversation on the table. Um, is something I'm interested in trying. And then also just being flexible and not holding your personal identity and your, in your health philosophy. I think that can be so incredibly damaging and dangerous. And you're a wonderful example, Matt, of someone who has kind of held your beliefs loosely in your hand and been willing to take in new information and then remold your idea of how this is applying to your life in this moment. And I love that you're like, listen, I'm not going to prescribe this for everyone, but for me right now, this is working. And I think if more people could just focus on that and focus less on hopping on bandwagons of what everyone else is trying to scream... Um, if they could just ignore what anyone else has to say about anyone else's diet and just focus on themselves and their holistic healing, then we would eliminate a lot of this divisiveness in mm. the holistic world. Um, so I just, I really like that. I really value your perspective there. So I think Thank that's, you. that's cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, cool. I love being in medieval towns in Europe because I can hear church bells ding on every hour. It's so great. I know. I th- feel like it's every half hour because I feel like I've heard uh, it. It's every 15 minutes. They do one ding at 15, two at 30, three at 45, four at the hour. And then after the four dings on the hour, it's the loud, the, the slower, longer ding for how what hour it is. So it's like one, two, three, four, and then boom, Boom, boom for three. So you and never have one, to. Two minutes later, they do it again, just in case you missed it. No way. You they never have to every, wear a watch. Every, every town, it's the same. Well, you wouldn't have to. Yeah, I mean, back then they didn't have watches, so. Right. Right now, you don't have to have. It's like, hey, they built that bell, and they want to get use out of it. You know what I'm saying? They're like, ding it as much as. <laughs> 2023, we're still going. Yeah, yeah I doesn't. Love it. I mean, they honestly, it's it's really cool. They they just never got rid of it, and it's kind of handy. I mean, it's it's cool, and it's. It's just amazing. So I, I really appreciate I, I appreciate your appreciation and I'm glad 
that uh, you know that you found value from from this. I just sharing my honest experience and you know regarding healing. One more thought I would add is that when I started you know going to do more meditation and doing these retreats, I really came to this feeling that, as I mentioned earlier, all I really wanted was to feel whole. So everything I was doing was to feel whole, and. Dr. Joe Dispenza had this idea he shared that really struck me that, you know, people who practice feeling whole, who get really good at feeling wholeness, for example, one emotion, then start to heal. Mm -hmm. So it's like people think you're going to do all these things with your diet or this or that, and then you're going to heal from all the stuff you're doing. But a different approach is like, what if you could actually just get really good at sitting down and overcoming the the mind running in circles and the fear and worry and frustration. And I think we all deal with this on, you know, I know I do on a daily basis, like getting, oopsie, there's the six bells coming again right now for six o'clock, two minutes later, they run it again in case you missed it. So anyway, fun fact, but um, like I know on a daily basis, I'm let's say guilty of uh, falling into getting impatient or frustrated or angry or losing my cool and reacting to people. And Somehow that's just part of, that's part of our life. It doesn't have to be, but uh, when I'm getting at back to my own, my own personal healing journey is like learning that I could actually sit, for example, in the case of meditation, you don't have to meditate to do this. It's just one tool, mm. one toolbox that works really well. Prayer is another one, right? But there's, and you know, there's a bunch, but there's a, a few that are kind of for these purposes in particular, meditation, prayer, certain energy practices, and that somehow the act of actually kind of sitting and dealing with those inner demons, if you will, like in my own personal sphere before going out into the world and letting the demons like the because the demons, they might be there in the morning when you wake up. And it's like life will kind of kick them up from their slumber. And if you just go out into the world and you haven't taken time to address, again, I'm using the term demons here, it might not be the best term, but these inner demons that want to cause us to say a mean thing or be unkind or react or get frustrated or do something that's harmful to ourselves. If we just go into our world, then things will stimulate us in a certain way that and we'll just follow maybe a pattern and react the same way. But I'm really working on personally how I can, you know, face those things beforehand to, to the extent possible, mm -hmm. and then maybe react less. And it, it seems to work fairly well in general. But so there was a meditation experience I had, where I just I remember like, really trying to let go of myself, you know, my attached concepts of who I was and all this stuff. And I just remember at one point feeling so amazing. Uh, this was when I first went to a meditation retreat and feeling this wholeness. And it was like, it was like some trauma is the term people use today, like some trauma stored in the, like in my gut, like in my, below my navel, below my belly button was like being released. And I couldn't help but think maybe it's, you know, from the perspective of energy and energy mechanics that I've studied from uh, all the stuff I've looked into and in bioelectromagnetism and how energy works in our body, maybe there was some kind of like almost like a kink, if you will, there's, you know, if you have a kink in a hose, water can't flow properly. It's like maybe there's some kind of kink in my energy field, if you will, caused by a certain stress or a certain reaction to my life that maybe had to do with, you know, parents getting divorced as a young kid and then fighting about money and, or just, you know, having this, this challenge and sort of absorbing that energy so much that like, I never felt really safe. Let's just say like completely safe, right? There was an instability and it, it makes sense to me that then learning about how these energy centers, so-called chakras in former times, but now there's more science behind this, uh, actually correspond to certain physiological processes like digestion. So I actually came to believe that it wasn't my you know, even my diet that was responsible for these issues. And it wasn't even all the other light stuff or even chemical stuff that I started to blame, although those all can further tax and stress the system, but just living in chronic stress and survival, it would make sense. Like, why did my other, you know, why do other kids not have issues with like digestion when they're five or six? But it made it, it to me, the high, my current, I'd say highest level of understanding about my own personal challenges was that there was some sort of emotional, psycho-emotional trauma that mm. was occurring or, and I love the term trauma because it's just overused, but like some kind of disturbance, something was out of balance that my body was like, again, in a survival state. And I know this is 
true to some extent because I've actually had to spend the last two or three years trying to consciously work myself out. Like I was able, once I started doing meditation, to look and see that I was literally living in like this tense survival mode for the majority of my life just by default because I didn't know there was anything else. Even if I was actually safe, in fact, there was no physical threat. I didn't act like my, my physiology was operating in a different way. And when you're stressed, I mean, try eating a meal and then getting into an argument with somebody and tell me how well you feel you're digesting your food afterwards. Like, it's just not in my experience. I, even if just today I had my lunch and then I got on a phone call right away. And I felt like, cause the phone call naturally requires me to exert my brain and think. And immediately I felt almost like my food wasn't just digesting or as if I was just like, ah, so my lesson from today is like, do not call people after eating a meal. Right? <laughs> I, know, I knew that already. I shouldn't have, but I was thinking that I was, you know, somehow better than your biology or better than my biology or whatever, that I could play God and his ways. <laughs> so anyway, didn't work. So anyway, um, that's, that's, that's really my personal experience. And I think it's important because these people, people who are struggling with these diets, again, not saying that everybody has there is somebody else who has a challenge with health or whatever, that it's also caused by some psycho emotional disturbance or trauma of some kind, but I've come to have the suspicion that for many people, it is that there mm -hmm. is some and it's not like it's something that happened to you years ago, that's like just affecting you. It's like patterns that we we actually relive them every day. So like, but it's usually unconscious. So that's so it might be something from ages ago. But it's like the choice or unconscious choice to keep being in that stress state. But a lot of people again, myself included until only less than three years ago, didn't don't even realize that there's a like a way to relax more and be more calm in life. And I'm still again, very much trying to work on this myself. So hopefully this is useful for some people. Yeah, I like your practice wholeness mindset. I think um, actually other people talk about that too. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. So I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for yep. sharing so vulnerably today. And Absolutely. I know that this will be impactful for folks who are particularly on a healing journey right now. Mm -hmm. I think you give a lot of hope and I think you give a lot of areas to open up and explore different avenues that they might not have been encouraged to explore. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. So thank you for that. And always a pleasure talking to you. I'm Likewise. sorry we're, we're cutting into your evening oh, chill no. time. Don't worry. But, um, yeah. And let pe this is chill. Let people know where they can find you um and your glasses and your products and uh and a course i heard you had a course yeah yeah give us so all the give details, us all the details. Yeah. so people can find on me on instagram at the light diet so the light diet and this is a my phrase for what we spoke about today things we can do based on science and also based on some more ancient eastern wisdom and, and knowledge to improve our health it's basically it uh, focusing in particular on light and energy and bioelectromagnetism and mitochondria and so on. So that's the light diet on Instagram, also on X, although I'm not super active there yet, but sooner than later will be. Maybe even and X is talk. Twitter for those who yeah, don't know. X is formerly known as Twitter. I'm just trying to be cool with the times now. So anyway, and then uh, the company is on Instagram, raw underscore optics. So raw, like the Egyptian god of deity of sunlight and uh, healing and medicine as well. So anyway, raw optics, it's just kind of a play on words for sunlight, raw optics. Anyway, uh, then the website is rawoptics.com, raoptics.com. So people who want to purchase the blue light protection eyewear to protect their retinal health and hormonal health during the day when they're exposed to artificial light can go there. And also who want to protect their sleep and circadian rhythm and melatonin production in the evening Equally as importantly, even maybe more importantly, with the red sunset lenses here. Again, they're also on raoptics.com. Uh, you can't buy clear lenses that don't work on raoptics.com. So although many other companies sell them because more people will buy them and they'll make more money, but we choose not to do that, even though people would buy them and make we would sell more probably because people prefer, sometimes don't want colored lenses. I don't know why. People compliment me on them all the time. So anyway... Uh, but the course is something that we haven't yet opened up fully for public purchase. But if people subscribe to our email list by going to roptics.com forward slash subscribe, then you can get updates when we do. It was included in our uh, Black Friday Cyber Monday offer, which is now over. But anyway, 
just subscribe to our email list and you can get updates or follow me on Instagram and you'll get updates about everything too. Cool. Right on. Outstanding. Matt, so, so great having you on. And um, I know there's tons of people that are going to be you know, probably chatting you up all kinds of questions from today. If you don't have questions, then you probably didn't make it to the end. And, uh, <laughs> and But anyhow, um, yeah, be, be, be ready for that. And uh, yeah, anything else? No, I think that's good for, for now. For now. Thank you yeah, I love so it. much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Until next time, Matt, thank you so much. Yeah, likewise. God bless.